Hello. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is uh, Titanda Chawanza. I've been a developer for what, three years and so forth. So um, I've used many t uh, technologies, which t t t today I, I want to share with you two, which I really enjoy using and so forth, which is GraphQL and serverless. These are, I, I've been gaining headway throughout the industry. And I thought maybe uh, since I use serverless a lot because it's, it's a nice entry level into the backend and GraphQL for front end, it makes it much easier to actually deploy a, a backend service. So today I want to talk about how these two can be combined together in one service. So before we start, maybe is I thought I'd do a recap on like what is GraphQL and what is serverless. Because before we, we dive into how they can work together, we want to find out how, what they are exactly. So maybe we'll start with serverless. And uh, the, main, the main thing to understand about serverless is that you need to understand why it's there. So many, like, especially node developers, we're living in a world where frameworks are coming up left, right, and center. Like if you're a front-end developer, it was Backbone, then it was, it was what, uh, Angular, then React. It was, so there's a purpose and a reason why these frameworks are there. And there's a reason why serverless is there. There's a reason why someone thought, okay, let's do serverless. And the first thing to realize about serverless is that serverless is not serverless. So by that, I mean that we, we all need servers. So either way, this, you're going to have this. So serverless does not mean uh, you don't have data centers. So either way, you're going to have a place to actually host your code. In fact, you're going to have more of it because now uh, many providers... Okay, so serverless, it's not serverless in the, in, in, the, in the state that there's no physical servers, but a definition, Wikipedia, source of all truth, serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model in which the cloud provider runs the server and dynamically manages the allocation of machine resources. So before, imagine you had to deploy a service, you had to uh, deploy a server or a, a, an API, you had to have the infrastructure. So you had to have like maybe a physical machines, you had, to, you had to actually have like a data center to actually deploy your code and by that connect that server to the internet and so forth and you had to like host this and you had to maintain this hardware and the entry level to actually produce uh, uh, an API for example was high. But now, uh, serverless computing allows you just to write a piece of code and basically you take that code and you you uh, upload it, you, you upload it to any provider. So now there's, the landscape is, is vast. So now providers can be AWS, put it the leader, there's Azure, there's Google and so forth. So the, all, all these providers, they basically take your piece of code and basically they using various gateways. Like for Amazon, uh, my talk will be based mostly on, on Amazon's uh, as a provider. Amazon, there's an API gateway as, as one. So you, like, you can basically vouch your roots and say slash whatever query go and execute this function. And basically, the good thing about serverless is that the advantages are that firstly cost. So imagine before when you had a physical server and you had a physical machine, uh, even when your traffic, even if, if you produced uh, an unpopular site, even if your traffic was down, you still pay for that server. You still pay for the, you still, uh, you still pay for that cost of actually running your server. But the good thing about Lambda and, or, or serverless is that when the traffic is low, Basically, uh, you don't pay for it. So you only pay for the minutes and the, and the amount of power that your, your Lambda function or your, your piece of code actually uh, uh, executes. So that's the one advantage. The good thing is scalability as well. So like what I mentioned that it's not just about one server. It's about now there's probably multiple. There's more than just one. Because now uh, with AWS, uh, in a way, the bad thing about this in a way is that it's very much vendor locked and you don't know what's happening under the hood. So a very basic, I don't claim to actually know how to implement this under the hood, but I, I'd imagine that whenever your code uh, wants to get executed, let's say a query comes, basically think Docker and containers. Uh, a container is basically sprung up, uh, basically with maybe uh, with a Linux, Linux environment, and basically it downloads your, so imagine serverless is basically you take your code, uh, your function, you package it into a zip file, and you upload it onto uh, some sort of bucket like S3, for example. And then all that is serverless, when a request comes in, maybe it instantiates a, a, a container with a Linux and so forth. It downloads your zip file, uh, and it, it unpackages it, then it runs the code and so forth. So you can imagine that now uh, with AWS, with CloudFront, for example, with S3, they can distribute your function, uh, your code around the world. So it's easily when someone requests, let's say your server from India, uh, the closest uh, region, uh, with, the, with, with, the, with the AWS data zone can actually run your code and proximity actually matters in this, in this case. So it'll be, it'll be much faster. 
So it's scalable. And this is something that you get, uh, you get under the hood, as in you get it uh, with no extra, extra cost. I mean, there's a, you, you do pay for it, but then there's something that you, you don't have to like, configure yourself. It comes just by the vendor. And easy development. So before, as a backend developer, maybe you had to like, uh, like configure a Linux environment, you had to configure the server, Nginx, you had to consider like security, you had to consider networking, you had to consider this, and like the, it was just a headache. But now, all that is taken away, and AWS, Bezos, just says, don't worry about it, I'm rich, I can take care of it. You just worry about it, you, you run your code, you run your code, give it to me, and I'll upload it onto S3, and I'll, I'll run it. So that's, that's the good thing about serverless, is that the ease of development, now we see that many front-end developers are actually getting into back-end because of serverless, and so forth. So that's uh, the, one of the main uh, reasons, the good thing reasons about serverless, and it maybe begs the question that, you know, maybe let's serverless all things, let's forget about containers, let's forget about, and just, so, but then there is a caveat. There are disadvantages. So one disadvantage of serverless is that code execution. So back to my example of uh, containers. So imagine when the container first springs up, uh, that time it takes to spring up, and then download your code and run your code, that time is time that it actually make your request longer. So therefore, there is what they call cold starts in the world of serverless. So basically, when your, when the first, your first, first request that comes in, it actually has to find a container, spring it up, go into code, and run it. So that, that cold start can actually delay your request for a bit. But now there is like, so the good thing is after that first initial cold start, after the container runs your code, like AWS, they actually keep the container in a warm state. So they don't, they don't shut it down for the time being. They keep it in a warm state, and maybe for like 10 minutes, if any request comes in, it can basically reuse that same, that same, uh, that container, then it's, it's quicker. So there, there are like uh, ways you can get around it, but yeah, that's something to consider. And then resource limitation. So at Lambda Function, I think AWS, the limit of, um, there is the limit to the amount of commuting, com, uh, computing power that you can put, uh, uh, that you can have in a container. So I think for example, for RAM, you can, you can only have about uh, two gig max RAM and the memory as well. So you, 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 you Lambda Function can't be above 50 MB. So yeah, they, they are like limitations. So if you're building like, uh, later on, I will, one of the, one of the users of serverless on Netflix, but not in, not in the way that you think they will use it. But anyway, and okay, the second thought or third point is vendor lock. So here you're like tied, you're tied to a specific vendor. So I mean like you're tied to, uh, AWS. If AWS fail, basically you failed, basically. If Bezos gets broke, you, you're broke. So basically you kind of tied, you're tied to a vendor and so forth. So that's the disadvantage and privacy. So, I mean, uh, right now, Microsoft and Amazon were fighting for a contract with, uh, with uh, I think, Ministry of Defense in America and so forth. So, it definitely, they, they didn't pitch serverless. I, I, I actually don't think they pitched serverless, because serverless kind of, you know, it means that their code is kind of, because I think the containers are kind of shared environments and so forth. So, I don't think they pitched, they didn't pitch serverless, I don't think, because it's like their code is, is maybe in a shared hosting, whereas for that, maybe you want like your own dedicated, like, uh, like hosting, kind of. So yeah, privacy is always one to consider. And then, so who's using it? So yeah, it's more or less who's not using it. I think everyone now is using it, uh, from CodePen to the Vogue to Netflix, Coca-Cola company. I mean, they they even they, they spoke at a at a at a AWS summit, and they even said that how they're saving more than sixty or the amount of money they're saving by using serverless because before uh, they were paying for every hour that that their server was up, but now they're only paying for for execution. Netflix. So Netflix, what I, what I spoke about, Netflix, they don't use serverless for their data crunching. So you can imagine Netflix, uh, like the, the speaker spoke of how when a video, when, you, when they first receive a video from a vendor, whatever, they basically split it and then they convert it into many different formats, like for small screens, for big screens, and so forth. So therefore, in that model, if you use serverless, you're limited in the, compu in the comp computing power. So for them, it's more or less, he, st uh, he stated that how they split the video into five minute chunks and basically they then uh, they encode it separately and basically they use serverless to then have an event to say when all these five minute chunks are actually encoded, then a, a, a lambda function then comes together and then combines them together. So the, so the serverless, you really have to know your use case. So it's not a matter of serverless, all things. It's a matter of you need to study and actually find out what's the best use case. Because for Netflix, ne Netflix, Maybe running a, a normal server, an EC2 instance, is the best for them for the encoding. So that's the that's the. So you need to really understand like what, what's the the best way around it. So now that leads us to so that's serverless done. Now to GraphQL. 
So GraphQL, another Wikipedia, source of all truth. Uh, GraphQL, so I think I won't really go deep into it, but just cover just a, a highlights. So GraphQL is an open source data query and manipulation language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling queries with existing data. GraphQL has developed in, was in, developed internally by Facebook in 20, 2012 before being publicly released in 2015. So you can imagine, uh, what's the old school? The old school was basically, uh, well, there's been many, SOAP, REST. So REST, REST, what is it? It's like a, a paradigm that, we all, that we've all um, basically agreed upon, how different servers can communicate and actually retrieve and give data uh, or communicate with, with, with other servers. So basically with REST, you have the, you have the file or the, the, uh, the part of the, you have get, where if you wanna get, if you wanna get information, you actually do a get request, you have post, you have, so yeah. So basically the best way to actually understand GraphQL is to do like a com comparison of REST and GraphQL. That's the best way to kind of understand the two and so forth. So it, the best way to do it, it may be to analyze Twitter. Twitter uses GraphQL, but then imagine if this Twitter site if you were basically hosting this and you had to do this in a REST API. So, so you imagine maybe for this main, uh, main blog post uh, or tweets, you have maybe a tweet endpoint. So maybe you have, so REST you have get, post, put, delete. So maybe for the first, to get all the tweets, you have a, you have a get tweets request. So in that get tweets, maybe I'll give you a tweets and it's an array of objects and in there you get all the different tweet data. So basically for each tweet, uh, I can give you the ID, the tweets, like the, the content, the user, Dan Amberoff, if you don't know him, but I spelled his name wrong. How dare, how dare I? But yeah, but yeah, Dan Amberoff, so he, he, basically you can get, get the tweets into objects, an, an array of objects of all the tweets, and, and, and that's basically a get request. So let's say they come again, uh, the front end team come in again and say, okay, fine, listen, uh, now we want uh, another request for when we click on a tweet, when I click on a tweet, I want to be able to basically have another API call where I actually have more data. So I want the comments of that tweet. So maybe we go, we go okay, so we can find, maybe we, we, we have another get request to tweet slash ID, which is a, a parameter we can use uh, uh, in our request. And there we, we actually just return a tweet as an object and we return more info. So now we return uh, the comments and basically it's an array of objects of comments of, of the different thing. So now we now have two URLs. And then we've actually we've had to bother we've had to bother the uh, the backend team again. And then maybe next week, like uh, listen, um, I want to click on Dan Abramov, and I want or maybe to hover over him. And when I hover over him, I want a, a brief outline of his uh, uh, of, of his profile. Then maybe you create another another endpoint. Say okay, fine, user slash ID Dan Abramov. And they come again next week saying okay, fine, listen, I want another request, and this time I want uh I, when I hover over his whatever and. It's a back and forth, back and forth. The back end team will just be like, listen, dude, do it yourself, basically. <laughs> that's, the, the area they can, that's how they can actually end up getting frustrated. So let's think of how we can actually change this and actually implement this with GraphQL. So GraphQL, uh, the schema language is basically, it works by types. So basically, uh, it's one URL. So one, in this one URL, it's basically, make, you can make anything you want, slash query. And in this one URL, you can basically have a query. And in this query, is, you can name it tweets. And basically, uh, by saying tweets, and then the, you can give it uh, whatever argument you want, uh, limit, for example, if I want to limit the amount of tweets I have, uh, so instead of having slash tweets, as in get, I can have this tweets uh, uh, query, and then this ending array is basically the return statement. So if anyone has used TypeScript, how many have used TypeScript? Yeah, exactly the same, so with TypeScript, uh, you, you can say this, this function returns whatever. So whatever, semicolon, then uh, whatever it returns. S same thing here, so here you're basically saying that basically this tweet will return an array of tweets. And basically a tweet is basically a, a type. So it means there's the mistake I made here, because tweet, uh, they should be a, a type. They should be a type um, uh, uh, mark, uh, namespace. So basically a tweet is a type. So it's type tweet and there shouldn't be a semicolon. Uh, to, to TypeScript, GraphQL, yeah. Well, maybe there should be, I don't know, damn it. Oh, but, 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 but anyway, uh, so basically I, I define what this object is. So a tweet is basically an ID, it has a tweet, which is a string, and basically there, there are many base, uh, base, uh, uh, base uh, uh, queries, uh, like base uh, statements, uh, things you can actually return, like, or, or, or data objects. So there's string, there's int, there's ID is one where just an ID. 
So basically, and then you can also have custom custom types. So basically, if I say user, I can say a user object, and basically, I, in the same uh, schema, uh, I can basically say uh, type user. There should be a type in front of this. I do apologize. So a type user, and a type user is basically has ID and name, followers, uh, and yeah. So it, it can have basically uh, any, anything you want. You declare it using the user, and this will basically map to what the data you have in your database or whatever. And so forth. So you declare your types, and, you, and maybe even your comments, and so forth. And then now, uh, now uh, on the front end, they only have to call tweets, and I, they only have to call tweets. And then uh, the tweets itself, they can they can choose what they want from the tweets object. So maybe for here, so okay, I'm kind of jumping. I, I think I. Okay, so okay, so think. Let's forget about this. Uh, the filters for time being. So just just think, uh, on the front end, I can basically say uh, call tweets and then tweets give me back ID, tweet and comments. And basically you, now the the front end now controls what they want. So the front end can say, okay, fine, give me uh, the whole tweet object and basically stick whatever they want. Or or they can say, okay, fine, uh, just give me ID or give me whatever. So now imagine how how that's very uh, dynamic. So now uh, instead of us having a, a, another endpoint. So imagine now uh, the 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 back end the front end team uh, front end team come back and say, "Oh, listen, I want to be able to click on a tweet and then uh, have more data like comments and so forth." So may, so maybe for the for the for the for the in, for the initial call, I don't want the comments. All I want is a tweet. So basically, all it is though, just have to, the, the the front end team will just omit comments, and basically the back end won't get the comments and so forth. But let, but now if they want comments, basically you can all, all they have to do is basically add comments. And basically say what they want. And uh, another cool thing, of which okay, my, my original talk was uh, was supposed to be about um, like uh, custom custom directives. So with uh, with GraphQL, you can have like uh, custom directives. Okay, so okay. So for for example, here let's say they want they they now want to have a specific tweet. So basically, they want to implement the slash tweet slash id uh, rest API. So now they want to have one tweet and that one tweet. Basically has comments, and, and, and maybe uh, in those comments you want to have the comments limited to a certain number of, of comments and so forth. So maybe now you can introduce a concept of, of filters. So now for tweets, uh, instead of you giving back just a limit, you give me back an object which is basically a, 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 or, or input of filters, which is a tweet a tweet filter, and a tweet filter is basically an input which basically you can define whatever you want uh, them to actually to actually request from you. So limit can be the amount of tweets that you want. Uh, IDs. So maybe you can say, "Go oh, fine." If you give me IDs, I will basically uh, give you back the, that specific or, or, or array of IDs. If you give me these array of IDs, I'll give you back these specific uh, tweets or those IDs and so forth. So that can be the filter. And then imagine now they say, "Go oh, fine." Uh, we also want to have uh, to like have the limit the amount of tweets we have or the amount of comments we have for each tweet. You can have a custom a custom directive. So custom directives in GraphQL is that whenever you requ request a certain a certain object or, or a certain field, so basically we've said that okay, uh, a tweet has got an ID, has got a tw uh, uh, has got a tweet for the string of the data and so forth, has got, co has got comments. So comments can be can be an array of, of of common objects. Then in there you can actually have a, cu a custom directive which basically can actually override the default resolver. So okay, so in the land of GraphQL. Um, this is how uh, this is basically the contract we have with the front end. So the front end we say, okay, fine, there's a query, and then uh, in this query there's tweets, and basically us in the back end we basically have to write a resolver, and a resolver all it is is a function. So for every single query you have, you basically have to have a function on the back end which is named exactly exactly the same as a query, which basically resolves what data the data that that is returned. So let's say I have a, I have a tweets uh, tweets. Uh, resolver is basically a function that basically maybe uh, makes a call to the database, and then it, it retrieves these tweets and basically returns it to you and so forth. So you can you, you can tweak these tweets, uh, or, or you, you can tweak the fields that you actually get for uh, from the database depending on uh, the query you actually got from from the front end and so forth. So imagine here you can actually using custom custom directives you can actually take uh, override these override the resolver. So now let's say uh, in this filter imagine uh, in this comments filter, they can say, okay, fine, give me a limit of 10. And then now, uh, when it comes to actually resolve comments, you can write your own custom like resolver, 
which basically uh, resolves the comments, uh, comments uh, variable. And in there, it will only fetch the first 10 comments. And then if, if you want, you can change it so, so that uh, they, they can fetch the next 20. Maybe have, have uh, another uh, uh, filter there that's uh, offset. So you can even like uh, make them, they can be able to even implement their own pagination and so forth. And all this is in one URL and so forth. So now using one implementation, we basically covered maybe what, what, what we would have covered with like four or uh, five URLs, rest URLs and so forth. So this is the main benefit of, of, of GraphQL. So the advantage is that, so good for complex data systems. So you, you can imagine like um, many people, they're coming from uh, a monolith system where it's just like one server and it's massive, then they don't, they don't take the system and change it into more for microservices, where it's like, the, uh, like each, each function or each like uh, purpose or each like business requirement has got its own like a uh, server, like each container like, uh, and so forth. So GraphQL plays a really good role in that it can be like the middleware between the front end and the back end in that you can make, it, make one query and then bit by bit you can make one microservice to actually collect, collect comments, comments and so forth. And then you take away that, you delegate away that, you delegate that, that work away from the monolith and you delegate it to, the, to that container. And then all it is in your comments, in your comments uh, resolver, you just point that resolver to the new, uh, to the new container. So that way uh, you, you can slowly move away from a monolith application and into a microservices, microservices, microservices application without disrupting the front end. That, that's a good thing about uh, GraphQL. There's no, of, no over and under fetching. So imagine uh, maybe uh, with REST, you can actually do it. I mean, so, so with REST, uh, I can have query params, like uh, queries in, in the URL, where I say limit and so forth and so forth. But then after a while, you, that fine grain control that you get with like a nicely uh, schema, with a nice schema, you can't get that. Well, you can, but then you're more, more messy. And then so here, and the front end control what they fetch. So the front end can say, oh, fine, I want this, I want that. They can cherry pick what they want. And it's almost like the front end can control the back end and the back end team can do less work and actually uh, back and forth like URL, creating URLs. And it's a self-documentation. So we rest now the technologies that, that have come about like um, Swagger. So Swagger, people have seen that you can build a REST API, but then how do you communicate with the front end and say, oh, fine, this, this URL does this and this URL accepts this. Basically, by having uh, Swagger is basically a, a, some sort of uh, a documentation where uh, you can basically have um, like it's basically a, a website which basically documents your whole your whole website and each 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 and every uh, URL is basically is basically uh, documented uh, in that Swagger documentation. So imagine yeah, for me I've I've actually worked with many projects with Swagger and the amount of work that's required you do your work you do your work and then afterwards you have to go and actually update this massive Swagger file. And for me, it was a headache, and many times it's, it's out of sync and so forth. But the good thing about GraphQL is by defining the schema, that's basically a, a documentation by itself. So it's self, it's self the, the document, self documentation. And then one advantage is subscriptions. So a nice little uh, feature of GraphQL is that uh, you can have real, so subscriptions are basically uh, real, -time, real time updates. So you can even maybe uh, have some sort of like a chat, chat, chat app where basically by using GraphQL subscriptions, you can have real-time real -time communication between two different clients. So there are many advantages to it. And obviously there, there are disadvantages, like the time to learn. I mean, this is a different paradigm to REST, so you need the time to learn it. And there are performance issues when you have complex, complex like multi-nested queries and so forth. I mean, now they've, they've actually, uh, they've actually uh, implemented stuff like um, a, a, data, a, a data, data loader because sometimes you can, you can end up making multiple requests and so forth, which, yeah, which basically makes it, makes your profile, like brings down your, your performance. That's something for another talk and so forth. Uh, basically, the N1, N plus one problem uh, is one problem that can exist, which is, has been solved by a certain degree and so forth. So yeah, it can have like performance issues and so forth. So it is something uh, to consider, but who's, who's using it? Literally, it's more or less who's not using it. So yeah, Facebook, Instagram, Coursera, Microsoft. So yeah, there are many companies which have uh, adopted this technology and the more people use it, it's, it's, it's open source. So many people use it and if you need help, there's tons of resources. That, that's the good thing, uh, uh, the good thing uh, uh, about it. So now into the why I think these are a good fit together. So imagine with, so with, with REST, you have many URLs, but then with serverless, uh, with GraphQL, 
you only have one, one request. So you can imagine you have one request slash query, and in there you, have, you define all your different uh, queries. And I mean, one thing I didn't mention is all, there's also like uh, mutations. So I mean, for this talk, I thought maybe I won't dive into the deep concept of, uh, deep concept of GraphQL teach, but rather how they work together and so forth. But yeah, but then yeah, basically one URL does everything for you. So one URL covers your fetch, your post, your creation, and so forth. So you better make sure that one, that your one URL is always up, so it has to be scalable, one. And also, it, it, it can't fail. So if it fails, you need to have a, a backup plan. And that's where serverless comes in. Because serverless, one, it gives you scalability out of the box. So whenever a request comes in, uh, it can just spring up a, a new a Lambda function. And also, uh, the good thing about it is it's scalable. So, you know, uh, whether you have one user or you have 10 billion, you know, uh, the amount of workload that's required, basically Lambda basically scales uh, accordingly and so forth. So I think, to, okay, to, to get to my, so now I'm probably going to do my next talk. It's probably going to go into a little demo uh, with, with, with the serverless. So basically to work with serverless, there are many things you can, you can use serverless. Some people basically, uh, for me, my talk, I'm, I'm going to uh, major on AWS. So with AWS, uh, there's something called, you can, you can basically uh, make all your, your Lambda functions and package them using uh, CloudFormation. So CloudFormation cloud scripts are basically, if you've used Terraform, it's exactly the same thing. It's basically this uh, uh, infrastructure as code where you can basically define all your resources like Lambda functions. You can define an API gateway. Which is, an API gateway is basically how uh, you, you, your router. So, so, so think, uh, uh, basically think of express, think of slash, whatever. That declaration, basically that's the role of, of API gateway. So API gateway takes your URL and it, it basically reroutes to whatever Lambda function that, that you assign to it. But then nowadays do not write manually or do not, write, do not go into the console and basically write Lambda functions. There's now many tools out there, and my favorite, which I'm gonna showcase here, the serverless framework. So this is basically a way to actually, uh, a nice framework where you can actually write a proper API, a, a fully fledged API, using just a, a YAML file and you, maybe your JavaScript code. So basically this solution is open source, and it, it takes care of everything. So you, you can imagine, it, uh, after you write your Lambda function, you can have many plugins which you can take Take your functions, uh, maybe even minify them. After it minifies them, it really like uh, it can even uh, uh, uglify. Then, then after it uglifies, it, it then zip it up and then upload into into the into the cloud and even provision your API gateway, provision everything for you just by running yarn install. So I think now it's best. I will do a little demo of uh, of the serverless framework. So the first thing you need to do is actually install uh, npm install serverless. So I actually have it installed on my machine, so I actually won't bother. But all you have to know is that the serverless, it basically, I can't spell. So this serverless, it basically gives you certain commands, and these commands are basically what you use to actually, zoom in, yep. Yeah, so yeah, so these commands, yeah? At the back. Yeah? Yeah, thanks, yeah. So yeah, so these are all the commands that the serverless framework gives you out, out the box. So obviously there's a configure. So you need to make sure that you actually have a valid uh, AWS account, and then you basically run AWS, uh, AWS configure. So basically go into uh, onto, uh, AWS, uh, install the, the command line client, then run if does configure, and basically that will basically configure, uh, basically you need to create, have a, a user, which basically you collect the, the, uh, the access, access ID and the secret access ID, basically, and basically that's what you use to put, uh, to configure so that this, fun this, this, this basically use that information to upload to your specific, uh, AWS account and so forth. So, okay, so with serverless, Let's say, so with serverless, uh, if you want, if you, if you want to, so with serverless, if you want to inst inst install, uh, uh, start a new serverless framework, 
you basically say serverless install and you, okay, so with serverless, you can have, that's a good thing about it, it's open source, so you, you can have many templates. So obviously, uh, these templates are basically a, a little blueprint you can start you, 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 your project with. So you can imagine, here I'm using this anonymity, uh, an an anonymity whatever, this function from these lot, uh, service, uh, serverless Node.js starter. So it, it's good to mention that with serverless, uh, you can use many languages. So Lambda, you can use Golang, is gaining popularity, Python, you can use .NET, don't do it. .NET is not, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not the best for serverless. Uh, and then, so you, can, you, you basically here, I'm using the Node.js starter pack, and the name, maybe I'll, I'll say it's serverless API. And by doing that, it'll basically create for me, uh, it'll basically create for me a, no, a serverless project out of the box. So, Yeah, so basically what I have here, it gives me a test of which today I won't cover test, so I can delete that. But the main thing you have to realize about serverless framework is that everything, this is where basically the magic happens, is basically this serverless.yaml. And the serverless.yaml is basically where you actually configure uh, like what lambda function actually, what, 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 what lambda function is actually used for what route and so forth. So maybe, first of all, you give it the service, which service is, okay, kind of happens. So you give it the name of your app, which is serverless API, for example. Uh, you can have many options like package. I mean, they have a documentation on the website, so you can just read it yourself. So, what, so package individually, the, this means that uh, for each, so basically imagine this, this, this certain framework, this certain like plugin I used, uh, basically it uses Webpack. So if you've used frontend, Webpack is basically a nice bundler, which you can use to actually bundle your code and so forth. So using Webpack, Webpack will actually bundle each function individually and make it so that, so that it uses the, the libraries that, that, that are actually required or imported within that Lambda function and so forth. So yeah, you can many have many options. Plugins, there are many plugins. So I mean, today I'll probably highlight the serverless offline plugin and so forth, but there are many plugins you can use here. The serverless bundle is basically the, what, what you use is a, is a Webpack bundler, basically. And then provider is basically uh, the name. So basically, there's the here, there's uh, AWS. Maybe you can have Azure, uh, Microsoft. Uh, you can have Google and so forth. So yeah, and the runtime is basically Node.js 10. So basically, you can have different runtime. So maybe uh, I, I think the the latest they actually support is Node 12. I think and stage region the region of, of where you want to upload your code on uh, in, in 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 AWS and so forth. So yeah, the many the many uh, providers you can uh, options you can have for that. But the main thing is is functions. So functions are basically are the function that you want to run for a specific uh, route. So imagine you say functions. And then you declare, let's say this one's called hello, for example. It's, it's called hello. Maybe I'll, I'll call it GraphQL. The name, this thing doesn't matter that much. And the handler is basically, the handler is basically the path to your handler. So in this case, the, is this. So basically, what, what I'm saying is that the handler is basically a handler hello. So basically in this, in this JavaScript code, uh, hello is basically my handler, for example. And then events, Events are basically like your, your router. So basically you're saying whenever an HTTP request comes in, the path, and the path is, is slash hello, uh, and the method is get, if, if, if that matches, you run this code, run handle the yellow. And that's as simple as, simple, simple as and so forth. So for us, uh, this is nice and so forth, but we wanna change this so that it uses uh, the, uh, 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 serverless. And to, to do this, there's one, there's one library we will need, which is basically, uh, I don't know if anyone has used Apollo Server, but they also have a, 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 a different offering, which is basically Apollo Server Lambda. And basically, Apollo Server Lambda is basically the offering for Lambda functions. So in a way, when you have your handler, you can take it this away. So we can say, okay, fine, for a part, we want it to be query. And then, okay, this, I'll skip this for the time being. But in there, we can say import uh, Apollo server from Apollo server while it downloads the entire internet. What the hell? Yeah, you can't wait. Okay, Apollo server lambda. Yeah, 
Yep. Okay. And then basically all it is we have to create our handler. So basically with, with Apollo, with Apollo server is very simple. You say a handler and you say equals new Apollo server. And then in there it can take, so it, if you've used Apollo server like without serverless, exactly the same thing. So obviously it expects type defs, which are basically your schema, your type definitions. So this is like, uh, uh, if you think of uh, the query and so forth, that's where you interprovided a, a basically a file where all, all the type defs are. So basically it expects type defs, it expects resolvers. So basically, uh, to, to every single query, like what I said, every single query has to have a subsequent resolver which resolves that, that query and returns data for it. Then, uh, apart from that, you can also have a context. So context is that uh, if you want to have, um, so context is, is a function. Basically, if you want to have data to be persisted, I mean, um, I'll show you the resolver code, uh, 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 the resolver code to, to fully explain this. But if you want to have data to be uh, persisted, uh, uh, through different resolvers, you can basically pass a context object. And this is where, for example, if you have some sort of like a library to actually fetch data from a database, you basically add that uh, model, whatever, to the context. So basically, I think here for, for serverless, you get the event. So event is basically the, uh, an, an, the AWS event. So when, when the request comes in, you can get event the body, but then for serverless, it, it doesn't really matter because we use something else for that. You can have, cont okay, okay, you can have many things here. Then all it is, you can. Then basically, this basically returns an object. So, uh, in this case, uh, so. Okay, so in this case, we have to create type diffs. And these type diffs are basically our declaration for our server. So I mean, uh, before I actually pre pre uh, prepared a small little uh, uh, type diff, so maybe I call it just I don't know, type diffs the JS. Then in there, we basically have our, our uh, schema declaration. So okay, this this was basically Elias to make it easier. It's nothing to do with serverless. This is basically an Elias that I made so that instead of typing everything, I just it just copies the code for somewhere. Yeah. But anyway, uh, basically, uh, this is basically our schema. So basically, uh, Apollo Server Lambda basically provides you uh, this service, uh, GQL, which basically can convert, it basically converts uh, a schema, uh, this into a schema declaration, basically. So basically, I mean, the good thing about having Webpack, so here, uh, it's, it is a JS file. But the good thing is about with serverless is that, for example, you can have like a, a bundler, for example, with Webpack, there's some even like other, other libraries or plugins where you can actually have uh, a physical webpack.config uh, in your file, and in there you can do whatever you want. You can install a, a TypeScript loader, a TypeScript loader, and basically have, and basically have TypeScript th throughout your code. You can install maybe even there's a GraphQL loader where you can actually instead of having a JS file uh, for for, you, for your schema, you can basically say type dev and basically it, it can be a full fledged GraphQL. You can basically import a full fledged GraphQL file and so forth. So yeah, the the landscape is, is vast and so forth. But in this case, I just use this uh, uh, GQL uh, from Apollo Server Lambda. And basically, I basically de de uh, declared my type defs, and it's a matter of just importing them. Type defs. So now, now um, I've got my type defs, which I've got here. Then now, all, all, all I need now is now my, my resolvers. So basically maybe here I'll create a, a resolvers file, uh, .js. Then like I said, so resolvers are, are basically functions that map to your, to your to type desk. So imagine here, I've basically declared, okay fine, uh, I have a query and that query, uh, uh, I, you can basically ask for a worker. So this is, this is a, a different talk that I made for the front end. But yeah, basically, uh, I can basically declare a worker and basically you can get back a worker. And a worker is basically an object with the ID of the worker, the first name, the last name, the email, and so forth. And that, that's what it is. So basically, I can say worker or workers and so forth. And then basically, in my, query, in my resolvers, I have a query and basically I need to have a, a, a resolver function which basically resolves to, to that specific query. So here, I have a worker and basically here, all this is a resolver function. You get about four, uh, four parameters. 
uh, arguments, which is the root, which is basically uh, 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 the data that the, the, the data that that's been collected already is basically okay. So when the request comes in and and it's basically hitting all, all the different resolvers, it will basically collect uh, collate all this data, and root is basically the collection of, of all this data. Then arguments are the arguments that the user can the user can actually give you. So for example, ID. ID can, can be uh, 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 it would be part of part of args. So here I say args dot ID. Then the worker is basically here when, when when I declared my context, right? Uh, I can basically pass in like uh, like I, I can pass it certain um, uh, certain uh, certain models, and these are basically uh, maybe classes to actually communicate with my backend. So for example, if I create a, a model here. And there may be, so this is a very simple uh, a model where basically I use uh, DynamoDB. So basically, I'm connecting to, yeah, okay, so yeah. So uh, I'm basically connecting to, to, to uh, DynamoDB and basically uh, I'm collecting uh, data from, 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 from DynamoDB and so forth. Uh, from DynamoDB and basically, I can basically import I can import that and basically give it the worker. And then basically what I put in the context is basically available in every single resolver. So uh, the third argument is basically context and it has the resolver object. So basically here I have worker.fetch for example. And basically if you look at the models, it's basically fetch is basically a command where I just, uh, uh, I basically fetch data from the, from the, from the, uh, the DynamoDB, DynamoDB table. And, and, and that's it. And then yeah, I basically have many more here, but yeah. Time. I actually won't go into it, but yeah. So, so now that by doing that, then afterwards, all I have to do is say exports exports dot handler equals uh, maybe call this server equals server dot create create handler, and then that's it. Then here in your serverless YAML, you say okay, fine. Whenever a function comes in. Go into a handler and then run handler to handler. Yes, bad naming, but anyway. The, and also, okay, fine. Uh, then I say that, okay, fine. Uh, I can actually omit method because, for example, if you, if you use a um, Apollo server, you can have a, a playground which you can, you can play with uh, locally and so forth uh, by saying true. So basically, a playground, when you hit uh, slash query slash get, uh, you can basically have this playground where, playground where you can basically play with your with your with your server in the meantime. So for post, it'll basically be retrieving the data, and for 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 get, it'll basically host this server. So when you have that saved, literally, oh, oh, so using as I said, as I said the the marketplace is vast. So there's, there's a plugin I use there, which is serverless offline. And so the good thing about serverless offline, you can actually host without deploying. You can basically host self host your your serverless function or framework uh, API locally. So if I just run serverless or SLS for short, offline start, I do apologize. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, for method, uh, it needs argument. So, for method, uh, we say here. I'm saying that for method, any any. So so uh, any uh, HTTP on slash query, just go to the uh, whether it's post or get, just go and run this function, and and then this create that handle will sort it out. So now, if I go to localhost three thousand. Nothing is there, but if I say slash, I say slash query. Lab coding is actually 
it is it actually uh, actual beast? So okay, so my bad. So you have to have uh, here for the models. I'm using the 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 uh, AWS SDK. So I actually forgot to download that. So yeah, so yeah. Basically, <laughs> once you have that SDK installed, uh, you can basically have your function running. Yep, you can basically have, yeah, so now imagine with, with, with this locally, you have your function running, and let's say here uh, I have a workers query. If I call that, there you go. So in the, in the, in the DynamoDB table, in my AWS, I actually have uh, pre-formatted data, and basically you, you can get that data. So imagine in, the, in just like five minutes, 10 minutes, I basically have a fully fledged API. So I mean, uh, one thing I was gonna, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how much time we have, but one thing I was gonna mention is that if you wanna save money, this will save you money, this, this is important, important. So a really good, which I, I discovered just a while ago, okay, so API gateway can get expensive. So API gateway is what they use to actually have the routing system, and the routing system actually goes to your different Lambda functions. It can get expensive. So I mean, there's, there's one like article that, 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 that this dude made where he actually compares API gateway and an application load balancer. So a load balancer, I mean, if you use in, in the world of servers, you can, use, you can use like a, for example, a, an Nginx server to actually have a proxy, which basically routes to different, different servers. So, so, you can, so you can distribute your, your, your load between different servers. So if you have high traffic, that load is, is just distributed between different servers and so forth. So the, the application load balancer plays the same thing, but then it's a, it's a it's an AWS offering. So here he actually compares the, the prices. So when you have many requests per second, the money, the, the amount of money you pay for, for API Gateway, so for the root actually hitting API Gateway, is like, is, is way more compared to just, uh, so you, you, your, your cost won't be, won't be to actually running DynamoDB or Lambda functions, it will be mostly uh, the API Gateway. And he was saying that if you switch, take out uh, uh, API Gateway and substitute, su substitute with, with a load balancer, you can save ab about, Six to five percent, and it varies. But then you can say a lot more. So, and the good thing is now, uh, AWS introduced a feature where you can actually uh, you can actually reroute a load balancer. You can you can actually reroute routes from a load balancer, and you can reroute them to lambda functions and so forth. So therefore, it's something that's to consider that if you think if you have a high voltage of of of, of request, it's probably best to actually do that. And then one thing, and then this is. I mean, if, if you've used CloudFormation, so uh, in, in your serverless function, uh, you can have a resources. And resources is basically a CloudFormation script of how to configure server, you can configure anything, servers, Lambda functions, and load balancer. So if you want, this is basically the script to actually have a, a, a load balancer. And basically, you need, to, you need to have a load balancer. Basically, if, if, if you never use uh, CloudFormation scripts, just think of it this way. You basically hear uh, the top half, I basically created a load balancer, and basically I create a listener. A listener is basically a fine. Uh, this uh, uh, a listener is basically a okay, fine. Whenever whenever I get a request, basically reroute it to here, and then basically here I'm saying that okay, fine. Whenever I get a request from a listener, reroute it to this specific uh, target group, and that target group down here is basically uh, is basically a target group which basically points to uh, lambda functions. So you're saying that the target type is, is lambda functions. Then, in your, then, for example, in your functions, you substitute GraphQL, and for events, instead of HTTP, use ALB. And the ALB, all, all it requires is a listener uh, ARN. So if, if you're familiar with um, uh, uh, AWS, ARNs is basically the unique, unique, unique identifier for each resource. You basically give the, the listener uh, ARN, uh, and basically the priority, the conditions, and the path, and basically, you basically save yourself 3,000 which I would want a portion of, because I've just told you this little hack. So yeah, so quickly, yeah, so yeah, uh, I'm basically done. So that's it.